Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Daily Objective. Today, with Mark, we're going to discuss something about California. So there have been episodes in the past talking about the big exodus from California, people leaving the state for various reasons. Uh, Mark, who has more experience, of course, with California, mentioned the other day that we should come back to this topic because there have been uh, <coughs> some persistent problems, some persistent issues, and we can maybe look at them from uh, our point of view. Hi, Mark. Nikos, how are you? I'm great. How is it over and... there? How is it over there in Greece? Now, I, 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 if I could think of one place that would be worse than California, uh, it would be Greece. Well, the good thing in Greece these days, or maybe not, so there's there's snow, and we have one of the most intense snowstorms in in living memory. Uh, you know how snow is. In the beginning, it's nice, haha. Then it becomes difficult. It causes traffic jams, but it's it's cute. It's cute because it's something that we're not used to, uh, as opposed to the socialist policies where we are used to. So in that way, we are. We are a bit like California. It's very nice if it weren't for, for the policies that have uh, ruined us. Or the political class ruining the greatest places in the world. Yeah, yes. and the voters who voted for them, because at least in Greece, the political classes have mostly followed exactly what the voters would want them to do. So I don't blame them. I blame, I blame us. But what is troubling you in California? Uh, but I think the same thing is happening in California. The voters have voted these messes into the state assemblies and into the executive offices, and these people are enacting the programs that they said they were going to enact. And so now we, the chickens are coming home to roost. Um, the, the good news about this is that some of the crime that, that some of these policies are incentivizing, they're, uh, for example, they're, they're trying to reduce prison populations. I think in a lot of the blue states, not just California, so they're reducing bails because they think it disproportionately affects people of color and people who are uh, impoverished, irrespective of the crime they've committed, it seems. They're reducing bails and letting these people out onto the street. Now, the good news about this, letting felons uh, back out into the street, is that they're, they're, they're committing crimes against the very people who voted these policies in. So the rich folks who thought they could sit behind um, gated communities are now being followed home from a restaurant because they have a high-end watch or car and robbed in their driveways, or people are actually going into Beverly Hills now and breaking into people's homes and committing robberies against them and sometimes murders. Um, so the people who, you know, who, who can vote in, the, in these leftist policies and remain aloof from the consequences are now, I think, starting to feel the consequences and hopefully this will start to have an impact. But what bothered me was reading in the California section of the Epic Times that California is now batting around the idea of single payer health care. So, um, and it's passing the committee and going into a vote fairly shortly. So explain a bit to us what this would mean and in what way would it be bad? I mean, we would agree that, yeah, we don't like this healthcare system, but why do you particularly think it would exacerbate the problems in California? And how do, is there any way that you could also link it to the issue of crime? And we can come back to the crime discussion and think, how could an ideology or a philosophy influence crime levels? But what makes you so worried about the single payer system? So this would mean that you'd have basically socialized healthcare in California. Correct. And that, and that, of course, will kill the private market, which means anybody who has private insurance, like me, for example, um, or gets insurance through union, the unions and or the private insurance companies are going to be incentivized to kick you on to, um, they were incentivized to kick you on to exchanges, now they'll be incentivized to kick you on to the state responsibility. So you'll likely lose your insurance as much as they'll promise you that you won't. Additionally, I think <clears throat> many of the... <clears throat> The concerns about hospital shortages, bed shortages, personnel shortages have been exacerbated by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, doctors are opting out. Nurses are opting out. The, the medical profession is leaving. Hospitals are closing because it's too expensive to run given the nature of the already um, centralized system and the way the state meddles in the system as it is. So any shortages that we have now exacerbated by the state are only going to be made that much more worse as we increase demand and put pressure on this system. So here's what I find very interesting in all this. 
everyone would see, including the supporters of these policies, that there is something wrong in California. The thing is that the more you see things going wrong, the more if you are someone who doesn't want to face reality, you want to double down. And we saw this also in a dramatized form in Atlas Rugged. And I use this because it's an example that many of our readers will be familiar with. As the things get worse, the plea by Dagny, for example, to the central planners in her own business, but also to the politicians is, leave us alone and we might be able to save something. What is actually happening is that until the collapse is complete, the point is this just proves that we need more regulations, we need more power at the end of the day. It's about power. And usually what happens in this case is that they try to find, uh, they try to find a scapegoat. From what I understand, at least when it comes to crime, the scapegoat is that we live in a quote neoliberal society, that there is not enough housing, uh, that there are not enough jobs. So what? So if you talk, you are among <clears throat> circles with many people who are, let's say, what we call the liberal elites. When you discuss with them, what is their explanation for California, for the deterioration in the cities? I mean, even if you are allowed to say deterioration, because they might tell you, no, it's it's not okay to say that if you have. Uh, people who are homeless and tense in the city center, but you know, who is to say that this is not more beautiful? So what is their reaction to the downward spiral of California, of California's, let's say, social and political life? I can't say that I'm, you know, uh, that I have my, my finger on the pulse of the leftist elite, intellectual elite in California. There are some folks on Facebook that I think are pretty savvy in that direction. Uh, they don't really acknowledge either. They 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 claim the problem is something systemically wrong with America, with the with the basic ideas of America. Um, so you know, crime is 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 a, a social problem. It's not an it's not an individual moral problem or failing on an individual's part. It's that society didn't do what it was supposed to do uh, to protect. And, and maintain a person's life from infancy uh, to adulthood. Society failed in some ways, so the solutions are social and institutional in nature and not, not moral failings. And most of these people think that the institutions are utterly and totally corrupt uh, because they're collectivists and they, and they see any hint of individualism as, uh, as a moral failing. So here's what this means in practice that when you say it's never on the criminal or to the person that have made uh, bad choices even if that person is not a criminal it's on society here's a particular example so first of all i know this idea because i've been teaching sociology and criminology for 10 years and this is at the center of criminological theory so when today a student goes to learn about crime they will find out that mostly it is, quote, relative deprivation that leads to crime. Notice, relative deprivation. Huh. Because you could have someone like Theodore Derrimple saying, wait a minute, there are poorer societies without much crime. But the progressive criminologists will say, ah, it's relative deprivation. So you see, when the poor person sees Mark Pellegrino, who is successful, he drives probably a nice car, he lives in a nice house, they say, why shouldn't I also have that? And of course, modern ideology, modern philosophy tells them, well, you want something, you should have it. Or perhaps Mark is having it because he has cheated the system. And we all know that this system is unjust. Therefore, you have, first of all, a justification of where you are in life and a sanctioning of where you are in life, which is bad, first of all, because it doesn't encourage you to try to go beyond that. <laughs> and even worse, a sanctioning even of you doing the crime, a sanctioning of you doing something which is destructive for the victim and for yourself. Uh, I used to know an academic. We actually used to be friends, but uh, he has written me off completely uh, since I changed my ideas from leftism. So uh, once he was mugged, and I remember he put on Facebook post that uh, the, the two people that mugged him with, with a knife they are not really different from entrepreneurs. 
Because what? Because we live in a society that turns to entrepreneurs. You want something, go and take it. And therefore, these two young entrepreneurs, they wanted his money because they needed it and they just took it. So this is a sanctioning by the direct victim. And this guy is serious. This guy is a serious, this guy is a serious altruist. So in a way you're saying, well, what you can do? Yeah, you, uh, you victimize me. There is, no other, there is no other choice. So this idea that behind crime is, quote, societal forces is destructive for the victims and for the criminals. And it will only going to exacerbate the issue. So, Mark, when we when we hear about crime, we hear all these reports that shoplifting is is skyrocketing. That uh, in California they shoplift and no one bothers to persecute. So, where does truth end and where does urban myth be, begin? There is this something that is actually happening. Is this, is there like a reality? There of, are uh, there are videotapes of people walking into you know Walmart, Walgreens, Target with uh, garbage bags and filling up the garbage bags and walking out and or running into a place, taking as much as they can from the shelves and running out with full ar arms full of clothes because uh, we have decided in California, the esteemed political class that anything under $950 should be a misdemeanor, it shouldn't be a felony anymore. Um, and so people are, in course, in, of course, encouraged enough to steal that some of these stores are closing down in major cities. Um, in, in San Francisco, um, you know, I, I think uh, Walmart is leaving. Uh, a couple of big stores that have economies of scale that you wouldn't think would be as affected by these kinds of behaviors are leaving major city centers in California because of this. And we mentioned that whenever things go wrong, the first thing that the left is going to do is going to find uh, scapegoats. So the scapegoat will be the capitalist who doesn't give a chance to these struggling communities. And of course, when you, when you say, yeah, but what about them? They have the philosophy of, of, of sacrifice that supports them. So we should care about the perpetrator, only about the perpetrator, and not so much about the victim. And we see this also when it comes to what is the penal system supposed to do? Because we are constantly told that it's supposed to rehabilitate. All my students who write essays about the penal system, they, they would say how much better it is in Scandinavian countries where prisons are like hotels and all that stuff. There's a very good point in that. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, there are so many laws and there are so many ways that you can find yourself into trouble that I, do, I wouldn't want the prisons to be medieval uh, castles and all that stuff but again notice the focus the focus is well you couldn't help it and therefore our, fo uh, our focus should be on the perpetrator because the perpetrator never it's almost as you take away <coughs> moral culpability and I would say something else you dehumanize in a way the criminal you it, these people think that they support them but they are actually dehumanizing them because they're telling them you couldn't do any better you didn't have what else could you do? There are, right. many there are many progressives who point this out, for example, with misogyny in uh, other religions, that when you say, well, if a woman is dressed lightly, what would you do? I could, uh, you know, say, you, you're going to be, you're going to sexually attack her. And rightly, they say, this is ridiculous, A, because what about the rights of the victim? B, you have free will and you can decide not to do it. And yet we have a blind spot when we, are when we do the same criticism when it comes to other crimes in the West. Well, they were poor. What about the thousands of people, the millions of people who are poor, and they don't resort to crime? Why aren't they a victims of, quote, uh, relative deprivation or of whatever other criminological theory I think, they I do? Think, so, I yeah. think science started turning towards sociology and economics and just as a straight out study. Um, it, it took the path of the animal, right? It took the path of, of Pavlov, of, determin of determinism, and trying to just, uh, you know, pigeonhole human beings into uh, not, not only a similarity with animals, but an I identity as an animal um, by removing their free will and claiming that they are parts of systems and uh, respond to incentives in the same way that perceptual level animals respond to incentives. So they remove free will and this, this is the result. 
look, there's a, there is a very good book. I think you, we discussed it in, in our meeting by Stanton Salmonow called Inside the Criminal Mind that directly refutes this idea of, um, of rehabilitation to, to the criminal. Um, the criminal, more than likely, the, the recidivistic criminal, the career criminal, has never been habilitated in the first place. They've been antisocial for, for decades. Um, and, 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 almost from the time they could learn to speak. It's a way of thinking, a way of orienting oneself towards society that they act on that needs to be reversed and not by, you know, not by catering to their feelings, but by treating them as willful individuals who think a particular destructive way. And those thoughts need to be re rehandled by direct concerted effort on the part of the criminal. There's also a book by Deirdre McCloskey, the, uh, the, the great economist, that, that I think it's titled, uh, Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich, which discusses how, how, how economics needs to be revised and renamed in, to humanomics and how so much of economics has gone the way of the social sciences by animalizing human beings and forgetting that they have this thing called free will and that there's there's lots of determinant factors that that have that, that are very internal that have to do with the, the way a person thinks that determines what they do and I, we have to get back to that or not that we were ever there we have to get to that notion of, of autonomous sovereign beings again in order to, to bring a, the, the right social system out and uh, i would say one last thing because I like the original daily objective uh, format where it was a short piece of commentary. So I only want to add one more thing, which is, I, I just thought about it. Our inability to accept the idea of punishment, isn't it a result of our inability to judge? So in a society that tells you do not judge, how can <clears throat> you punish? Punishment requires judgment. I judge that what you did is wrong. And therefore, I'm confident to say, sorry, you should go to prison. Or it requires a self-esteem that says, yeah, I have the right to be protected from, from your wrong actions. Therefore, again, off you go to prison or whatever else the punishment should be. But a society which is always a society of excuses, a society that says no one can help anything, then you cannot judge. And if you cannot judge, you cannot punish. And the results are the results that we that we see around and of course that there's no reason why they should not be they should not be way worse well we know that morality is is the realm of choice right without choice there is no such thing as morality when you're a determined being when everything outside of you is what pushes you to do what you do there is no such thing as choice there is no morality you can't judge there is no real right or wrong so you've you've morally disarmed a society uh, to, to do what it has to do it, it, to protect itself from malignant actors like this. Hey, I'm, I'm all for decriminalizing victimless crimes. Our, our prisons are too populated with people who have done nothing to actually uh, harm another human being. It's the, but the people who have, have harmed the other, uh, really harmed people should be in there. Um, and the, 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 the reason they should be in there is not just to serve time and to become better, but to pay back the victims. And that's what they are, should be there for. Pay restitution to the victims of their crimes. And it should be hard and it should be unpleasant. It should be a place they don't want to go back to. And they should be held accountable for what they've done. Um, and, uh, and maybe that will start to disincentivize uh, people from committing crimes. And we mentioned uh, Theodor Delrymple. Uh, he was recently in trig Trigerometry, which is a, a UK-based podcast put on YouTube. Uh, Trigerometry, Theodor Del Delrymple. I can't pronounce it. It's, a, it's an interesting interview. A very, very unconventional take on crime and something that you will not find in the sociology and criminology, uh, criminology textbook. So let's go to the Super Chats. So thank you very much, Marilyn. Thank you, thank you, Kiana. Thank you again, Marilyn, th three times a day, super chatting. Thank you very much. So Marilyn says, Dr. Same now says criminals can only change if they acknowledge that they're responsible for their actions. That makes sense. That makes sense. We hear it also with, uh, for example, with alcoholism, that unless you realize, okay, something is wrong, you cannot change it. But again, 
I'm not saying that the criminals study criminology and they figure out, oh, I'm going to get away with it, <coughs> at least morally, and they become criminals. But this sets the tone for the whole society. The whole society says, well, no one can help it. So, and uh, we need to think. Remember, Leonard Peikoff mentioned it in one of his radio programs. Bill Clinton saying, I'm no better and no worse than anyone else in this uh, country. So what does that mean? No one is better than anyone else. In that case, whether I'm a criminal or I'm a benefactor of uh, humanity and a very virtuous person, then it's one and the same. So definitely this... this... Look, I, have, I, I think the criminals literally are um, reacting to incentives in the way that an, an animal is because they are living in the range of the moment. They are living at a less human level. And when... When these, in, when these incentives are produced, they follow them. I've, I've heard people, I, I mean, one of the most shocking things I ever saw somebody say on, on TV during the riots in, in Los Angeles in the 90s, as they were leaving a store uh, with a television set in hand, a reporter said, why are you doing this? And they said, well, it must not be wrong. The cops aren't stopping me. And they walked <laughs> and they continued on. That's a, a range of the moment level of thinking that that is that our culture uh incentivizes for your information mark uh, the the modern the modern theories in criminology is that riots happen because of consumerism mm -hmm. so people are consumerists and therefore they break in and take the flat tvs jonathan very uh, generous thank you very much for your contribution thank you enric and a question for you mark by allison Mark, have you decided where you're moving to yet? Yeah, yeah no, um, I, I wouldn't mind Nashville, but uh, New Hampshire also seems to be number one on the Freedom Index in the States. I know that there's unfortunately some anarchist communities in, in, in New Hampshire. It makes me a little uncomfortable uh, to live amongst anarchists, but uh, you know they, they are the freest state in the oh, United that States. was the Freedom Project or something, where all libertarians would move, would move to New Hampshire. Yeah, I remember that was a thing around 2013, 2014, but yeah, yeah numerically. And, and speaking of freedom, I think in New Hampshire, you have a free concealed carry. So you don't have to even get a permit to carry a concealed weapon in New Hampshire. I could be wrong, but I think that's so. And I don't remember any uh, gun crime happening uh, in New Hampshire the way it happens in other states. But hey, I'm just throw I'm just throwing in a little Second Amendment love there for for no reason. Why not? Okay, so coming up, 8 p.m. UK time, reverse engineering happiness. If I'm not mistaken, I'm there today with Tal and Amanda. 9 p.m. UK time, 8 BTV, free will and values. 10 p.m. UK time, method method in madness. Don Watkins joins. Uh, the the Aporia guys to talk about prayer and the Ten Commandments. So this oh, is a great oh. Monday. This uh, you have one, two, you have three hours from eight till eleven. Three hours straight of good content. So that's why it makes sense and it's worth it supporting Iron One Center UK and supports Razi. Again, you see all these things. You might think there are. 15 people behind the scenes pulling these things together. Actually, there is a team and uh, a, a team of four people, but yeah. the number one person, in five people, but the number one person in terms of waking up and sleeping not that many hours thinking about ARC UK and how to make it better is Razi. So help him by becoming a member of Finance Center UK. Like, share, super chat, all that stuff. And thank you so much. For those of you who are doing it, Mark, thanks for bringing us up to date with what's happening and providing some depth on what are the reasons behind it. Hopefully, uh, we're going to have some better news soon. And uh, although I'm not very optimist, but at least again, sometimes you live in a nice place. There is a, a point up to which you can say, I'll forget politics, but I'm not sure where this line is. I'll, I'll let you know when I decided with Greece. Okay, thanks everyone and Thank you. goodbye. Bye-bye.